So, welcome everyone to the fourth session of VMW. Um, our first speaker this session is Ken McMillan. Uh, Ken is a researcher at Microsoft Research in Redmond. He is one of the leading members of the CARB community with his work shaping significant parts of what the field looks like right now. Um, he pioneered the symbolic model checking techniques with the uh, SMV tool scaling these techniques to significantly larger systems. And he received the CAV award in 2010 for this work. He also introduced um, interpolation to the field of verification, which again has become a modern, a mainstay of modern verification uh, techniques. On a personal note, I had the privilege of working with Ken during an internship like 10 years ago. And that experience still colors some of what I think a good researcher should be. So uh, without further delay, let's welcome Ken and listen to his thoughts on model checking. Hey, thank you, uh, Arjun. So, okay, this talk is about um, model checking as a research paradigm as opposed to as a technique. And, and I think this is interesting to talk about here because you know, model checking is a major uh, 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 research topic at CAV, and what I'd like to do is describe some of the fundamental problems and strategies within the model checking paradigm. Uh, first, I'll take a moment to introduce myself, although I know Arjun already did. Uh, so I started out actually as an engineer, uh, and that's one of the reasons that I got into verification. Uh, I wound up doing a PhD in computer science at Carnegie Mellon, arriving there in 1987, and my advisor there was Ed Clark, who was, of course, one of the originators of uh, model checking. So I was very fortunate in that way. And then since then, I've been doing research that in various ways relates to model checking, uh, including uh, you know, model checking techniques, but also applications of, of model checking at various research labs, including Bell Labs and Cadence Research Labs, and most recently, uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, and a couple of things that I'm best known for, as Arjun mentioned, are symbolic model checking and Craig interpolation. And I'll talk a little bit about both of those things in this talk. Okay, so as I said, I want to think in this talk about model checking as a paradigm, right? So a, a research paradigm, in a research paradigm, what you have is a collection of unsolved problems and a collection of strategies for solving those problems, doing what Thomas Kuhn called normal science. Uh, so I'll talk about what are some of the fundamental unresolved problems within the model checking paradigm and also the strategies that we use to solve those problems. And what I'd like to do is to, in a way, provide a way to uh, look at, say, a paper that you're reading at CAV or a talk that you're watching you know, and to analyze it in terms of these sort of larger ideas from the, from the paradigm. Uh, so to understand the problems of model checking, you need to go back to uh, sort of the origins of model checking, where it came from and why. And uh, of course, this was something that Rajiv talked about uh, somewhat in his uh, talk. Um, so the problem that we start with back in the 1960s, when you know, people have started to program in earnest, is that programming is a very unreliable process. And so, of course, in the 1960s, we have the idea that you could apply logic to that process to try and make the process more, uh, make it into a more reliable or, or more scientific process. Uh, and this is coming from people like Floyd and Horror and Dijkstra. So when you start applying logic to programs now, you're getting at this problem of unreliability, but you're introducing other problems. And these problems, a couple of these problems are, first of all, you need to be able to specify what you want to say about the program. And if you start, for example, with core logic, you may find that you can reasonably write a specification of a procedure, but writing a specification of what we might call an object or reactive program uh, would, would be more difficult or impossible. So we have what I'll call the can't specify problem. Uh, and of course, the elephant in the room, we have the problem that proofs are very hard. Right? And this is one of the reasons that uh, 
Lipton, Perlis, and Danilo, you know, we're, uh, we're saying that, you know, this is not going to take off this idea of verifying pro uh, programs. Part of the problem that they identify is that proofs are just very hard, although they identified lots of issues. Okay, so now in 1977, you have Amir Panwelli coming along and he's attacking this problem of can't specify. And he's saying, well, what we really need to talk about is the temporal sequence of execution. So we can talk about programs that interact in an ongoing way with their environment, that have no definite moment of termination and so on. We can prove things like liveness under fairness using temporal logic. And so this is getting at that problem that I call the can't specify problem. But it doesn't really get at the proofs are hard problem. In fact, it might make the proofs are hard problem even harder. So now in that context in 1981, after, as Rajiv mentioned, Lipton, Perlis, and DeMillo, you have Ed Clark and Alan Emerson and Joseph Sifakis coming along with temporal logic model checking and here, in this approach, proofs are free. Right? All we have to do is model our system as finite state and express a, a specification in temporal logic, and we don't have to do proofs anymore. So you could imagine that this is very compelling uh, at the time. So that is a technique as it was introduced, but you can think of it in a larger sense in what I'll call the model checking paradigm. And in that paradigm, you have three things that are part of your scientific world. You have some kind of a system model, originally a finite state model. You have some notion of a specification or a property that you want to prove, which could be written in a temporal logic. And then you will have an algorithm that tells you yes or no, does the system have the property? So for the right logic and the right kind of model, you could solve this problem in linear time. For example, for computation tree logic, in other words, the proofs are free. Right? And of course, what this means is, and the trick is, that the user has to squeeze his or her problem into this form in order to be able to get out the proof for free. That's really the big trick. So any application of this paradigm where you have a model and some kind of property and an algorithm to show the model has the property, I'm gonna call model checking you know, in the broad definition. Uh, so what we do is, again, we define a class of systems and a class of properties, and we find an algorithm to show the system has the property. Okay, so, of course, every solution to a problem creates new problems. Right? And on the positive side with model checking, what did we get? Well, we got two very important things. One is that proofs are free. We don't have to write down any of our proofs. And the other, perhaps more important, is that counterproofs are free. In other words, if your system doesn't have the desired property, you get back this behavioral counterexample that shows you why it doesn't. You get actionable feedback. And those two properties together, proofs are free and counterproofs are free, I'm going to lump together uh, with the name golden baby of model checking. Right? This, is, this is the part that's really most important. Now, on the negative side, we have introduced a number of problems. The first is what I'll call the can't model problem. Right? That is to say, your problem doesn't fit into the model that I defined, and therefore you can't prove your program. Or you have the can't specify problem, which is saying, you know, you can maybe model your problem, but in the logic that I gave you, you can't specify it. So that would be true if you have, a, say, a very weak logic like CTL. And then perhaps most interestingly, you have the can't scale problem. I could model and I can specify, but my model is too big and I can't get an answer because the technique doesn't scale. Okay, so these are the problems now that we're always going to be attacking in model checking. And as we'll see, of course, those problems are tightly interrelated. In other words, when you push here, something pops out over there. And this is what I'm going to call the model checking whack-a-mole. In other words, it's a game we're going to play where we are pushing in on some of the weaknesses of the technique, but we're going to get out some problems as a result. So for example, in model checking, originally what we would model check is a Kripke structure, a finite state graph. This is something that Rajiv was talking about. Now, if you go from a finite state graph as a model to say a sequential circuit, then you get the ability to model more interesting things. Now, you wouldn't want to write down a Kripke structure for your sequential circuit by hand. 
But on the other hand, now you've got into a scaling problem. That is, your model checking problem is now going to be P space complete instead of being linear time. And another way to say this is that we have a state explosion problem in converting that sequential circuit into a Kripke structure. So another issue of expressiveness is that we may not be able to model something because we have a system that has an arbitrary number of processes. And so as we go from a model that has just one process to n processes where n is arbitrary, again, we're gaining a lot in the ability to model, but now we're giving up the idea of no free proofs, right? because now this parameterized model checking problem is actually undecidable. We have no algorithm that can definitely give us a proof or a counterexample. Right. Or let's say we want to go to a more expressive logic. So we start with computation tree logic, a very simple, not very expressive logic. We want to move to say linear temporal logic or CTL star, which encapsulates both of those logics. Well, again, we're going to increase our ability to specify. Now we can specify more things, but now again, we can't scale as well because the complexity is going to be high. All right. So this is the model checking whack-a-mole game. We push in here, and something pops out over there. And so if you look at the research strategies that people use within the model checking paradigm, you quickly see the development of a basic set of strategies for playing this game. And I'm gonna give these strategies colorful names that will hopefully be memorable. So I'm gonna talk about four strategies that I'll call apply magic, give and take away, lower expectations, and throw out the baby. So if you look at almost any paper in the model checking area, you'll see that it's applying at least one of these strategies. And I'm gonna talk about the benefits and the pitfalls that come along with those uh, strategies. So the first strategy that I've called apply magic is essentially a, a direct attack on intractability. In other words, we're going to try to solve an intractable problem by exploiting some structure that we imagine exists in practical instances of the problem. And there are many techniques that fall in, into this category of applying magic, trying to get around you know, intractability. Uh, so- Ken, there is a question which, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. So Siddharth asks, what is the difference between a model and a specification? And in particular, how can we model but not specify? Uh, right, okay. Well, okay, look, at, if you step out of the model checking paradigm, then those things are not really different. Right? In other words, a model you could think of as a specification at one level, right? and, a, um, and a, uh, you, know, you may have a higher level specification that you then want to show that it implements. Right? So, so outside of model checking, there, there is no difference. Inside model checking, on the other hand, the specifications and the models usually look very different because they're written in very different formalisms. So for example, the model might be expressed as a state graph, you know, perhaps with some fairness constraints attached, whereas the specification is going to be written in a temporal logic. So you have a kind of, a, kind of asymmetry there. And in a very technical way, at least in the original model checking paper, the, no the notion of model was actually the, 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 the um, a logical notion of model. In other words, we're saying we have a logical structure and we want to show that it is a model of a formula. But this is very much a, this is very much a technicality. I think the only really important point here is that models and specifications actually look rather different within this paradigm. So um, these, so when we are applying magic, okay, when we're trying to skirt around intractability, we're going to have to have some kind of clever algorithm that will operate on some reduced form of the problem that is not on a state graph, but on some other representation. And we have a variety of algorithms to do that. So we have symbolic model checking, which is using uh, normal forms in logic. We have symmetry reductions where we're trying to reduce the state space by uh, con considering states that are equivalent with, res with respect to symmetries. We have partial order reductions where we're trying to look at fewer behaviors I, uh, where we take one behavior from an equivalence class with respect to some commutation operator. So we're trying to operate on some reduced representation that will allow us to scale better. Okay, and so you can think of that as a direct attack on the, on the can't scale problem. 
And an example of that is BDD-based model checking, which goes back to the 1980s. It's something I worked on in my thesis. Uh, and the idea there is that you want to avoid building that Kripke model or that state graph by instead using a succinct representation in logic, usually some kind of normal form as an implicit representation. And the representation that I used for that originally was a binary decision diagram, which is something that was being studied by uh, Randy Bryant at, at CMU. Uh, and here, the idea is, is, is really very simple. Here we have a decision tree for a Boolean function, where you start at the root of the tree and you look at each variable and depending on its truth value, you go left or right. And when you arrive at the leaf, you know the truth value of the function. So this is a decision tree for a particular Boolean function, but it's rather verbose. We get the BDD by essentially um, collapsing out the redundancy in this tree that is by combining isomorphic subtrees. And here's the BDD that we would get as a result. And what we're hoping is that those represent, representations will be succinct because of some characteristic of the system that we're verifying. In other words, we hope that we're in some way exploiting structure. And in order to do that, we sort of always have to tell ourselves a little story about what structure there is in the system that we're exploiting. So in the case of BDDs, suppose that we have two processes A and B that are executing in parallel, but they don't share very much mutual information. That is, if you know the state of A, it only tells you one bit about the, uh, of information about the state of B. Well, if you look at the binary decision diagram that re uh, represents all the joint states of that system, what you would then find is there's a cut in that graph where you have only two nodes that represent that one bit of information. So you can tell yourself that systems might have this structure and I might be able to exploit that with a binary decision diagram in order to scale better, that is to apply magic. But of course, the pitfall with all of these apply magic techniques is that magic is unreliable. In other words, you're never going to really fool asymptotic complexity here. If you have a technique that's working on a hard problem, you're going to find that from time to time, randomly and unpredictably, it's just going to fail. You're going to have a long tail of execution times, if you will. So that's the, that's the main pitfall. Another pitfall is that because you don't have an asymptotic complexity result, you can only argue that your technique works by looking at a bunch of practical examples, in other words, of benchmarks. And it's very hard to collect an unbiased collection of benchmarks. And you have to be very careful about that. Okay, so strategy number two in playing model checking whack-a-mole is something that I'll call give and take away. So the idea here is we want more expressiveness and we're going to try to expand our expressiveness, but at the same time, place some very careful restrictions on how we're allowed to model things in order to avoid undecidability, not to cross the boundary of decidability. And there are lots of techniques in this camp. For example, in the, in the late 80s, uh, you started to see work on parameterized model checking, where you could, have, you could model check a system of an arbitrary number of processes in a suitable logic. Or uh, we have, uh, for example, timed automata that allow us to introduce real valued variables in a very limited way and, and maintain decidability. Or uh, piecewise linear, linear hybrid systems, well-structured well transition systems, and on and on. We have all of these formalisms that are very carefully designed to maintain decidability. So we get still all the good properties of model checking. Okay, so when you are giving and taking away in this way, usually the next thing you have to do is apply magic. And the reason is you'll still wind up with an intractable problem and you need some magic to solve that intractable problem. So what you often will see is after a give and take away paper, we're gonna have a series of apply magic papers. So a good example of that is something called a well-structured transition system. And so here, let's suppose for example, that we have two finite state processes that communicate asynchronously on two unbounded channels by sending messages to each other. Well, you can easily show that just in this simple scenario, proving anything interesting about A or B is going to be an undecidable problem because, for example, you can simulate a two counter machine. So the way we'll get around this problem is putting a restriction on. For example, we could say you can have an unbounded channel, 
but the channel has to be lossy. In other words, it has to be able at any time non-deterministically to lose any message. The message can just fall out of the queue. And it turns out that if you do this, if you, if you, you can build something called a well-structured transition system for which control reachability is actually decidable. And so we've expanded and then we've taken away a little bit of expressiveness by requiring lossiness. So as I said, magic often has to be applied to such kind of, to such problems because this problem of verifying a well-structured transition system has horrific complexity. And so we have to think of clever algorithms in order to apply it uh, in practice. And a lot of papers have been written about that. So the pitfall in any kind of give and take away technique is that as you approach that decidability boundary, those restrictions become more and more idiosyncratic, or, or I like to say that the boundary of decidability is very jagged. And so it can be very hard to determine if any particular problem you want to solve can be fit into that rather strange and restricted formalism. And so you have this problem of one system per paper. In other words, you have a system and you can verify it by introducing some class of models but you can't verify anything else with that. And for the next system, you need a new class of models and so on. Okay. Another pitfall of this kind of technique is that it requires the user to fit the problem into this very idiosyncratic model. And if you looked at that from the outside, you might find that the proof that you need in order to translate your problem into that formalism could be harder, right? than just doing the proof from scratch in you know, using some other technique that doesn't involve model checking. Okay, strategy number three in model checking whack-a-mole is um, something I will call lowering expectations. And the idea is you're going to compromise on one or more of those five criteria. And if you look, you know, a lot of the work in model checking is really taking this approach of lowering expectations and there are different ways to do it. There are different dimensions on which we can lower expectations. For example, we can give up proofs are free. For example, uh, there's a technique called bounded model checking that can verify the executions of a system up to a fixed number of steps. So it can find a bug in your system, but you'll never get a proof that uh, the system is, is uh, correct for all executions. So you're giving up proofs are free. Uh, we similarly have you know, statistical model checking and runtime model mo monitoring, various kinds of uh, you know, concolic testing and so forth. They're all in this category of now looking for bugs but not getting proofs. Or you can give up some of can specify. For example, if you have a property of the system that's very simple and shallow, uh, like the program never commits a Naldi reference, doesn't say what the program is designed to do, but it's just a very simple shallow property. Well, you might be able to use a very weak abstraction of the program to verify that property. And that means that you would be applying relaxation methods, which is something that I'll talk about, uh, talk about in a minute. Okay, another way that you can lower expectations by, is by giving up on counterproofs are free, right? where you don't get real counterexamples anymore. And typically the way you're doing that is by using some kind of lossy approximation often an approximation that's provided by a user or that's provided by a tool creator for a particular class of problems. And abstract interpretation te techniques are typical of this, where you can prove the property, but the counterexamples are not reliable. Or the last category is you can just give up on specifications altogether because in the real world specifications can be hard to get. And so what you'll do instead is you'll try and infer some very simple specifications from context. So we've, we've given up the idea of specification at all, and we're just looking for some typical defect patterns that we can identify, or we might be comparing two programs to see that they're equivalent or to say that if one program is correct, then the other is correct and so on. So these methods are gonna give neither proofs nor counter proofs, they're only going to give warnings. And of course, the obvious pitfall of that is when you lower expectations, when you say, I'm going to give up on some of these important characteristics, you may also lower the practical utility of the technique. And you have to ask, is that technique that is lowering expectations, is it actually solving anyone's practical problem? 
that's something then that you have to be able to demonstrate. So a good example of that is bounded model checking. And in BMC, we consider only n steps of execution of a system for a fixed value of n. And we're going to then build a logical formula that describes all the bad executions of the system up to that fixed number of steps, n. So the formula looks like this. It has some initial condition that you express about the initial state. Then it has a sequence of copies of the transition relation that describe a sequence of potential transitions of the system. And finally, you have some bad condition at the end after n steps that you want to show is not feasible. Right? So you just build a formula, and then you are going to throw it, of course, at your favorite magic, which might be, say, a Boolean satisfiability solver. Right? We're going to use the satisf satisfiability solver to possibly find a bug. So, of course, lowering expectations always introduces its own problems. And here the problem, of course, is how big should n be? How do we know when we're done? And, you know, and papers have been written about that, but that's, you know, that introduces a very hard problem. Okay, so lowering expectations. The final technique that I want to talk about, I'm going to call throw out the baby. You remember I said the magic baby of model checking is proofs are free, counterexamples are free, which means I don't have to put in any human effort. Right? I don't have to think very much to solve this problem. So when you throw out the baby, what I mean is you're going to apply some human effort in a judicious way, as little as possible, so that the proofs are not free, but they might be cheap. In other words, I might, being able to do model checking might help me in my larger proof. Okay, so there are two sort of basic techniques that, that we we'll use there. And the first is abstraction. So here, a human being is going to give us an abstraction to use in the model checking. And what abstraction really means is it's narrowing down the range of possible proofs. So that's going to make the problem of searching for a proof within that range easier. So an example of that would be, say, a template invariant method, where I'm going to do a proof by inductive invariant, and I'm going to give you a range of formulas, some kind of class of formulas that you're allowed to use in that invariant. And by narrowing down to that class of formulas, I'm going to make the problem of discovering an inductive invariant easier. And there are lots of techniques to do that. For example, there's uh, the invisible invariance technique that can discover invariance with quantifiers, but within a limited range. Uh, and you know, various other techniques that can do reasoning uh, about quantified invariance, again, because we're restricting uh, the invariance that you're allowed to use. Uh, or another good example of an abstraction is just a manual localization of the problem, which is saying where the human user is saying, I think that these components of the system are not relevant to the proof, so you can throw them away and not think about them. Okay, so the other most common technique in throwing out the baby is decomposition of the proof. In other words, the human being is going to break the proof of the system down into a collection of lemmas. And these are often localized lemmas that talk about a single component of the system, although they don't have to be. Now, the idea is that after the human has broken down the proof into these small pieces, that the machine should be able to check the proof. In other words, we should now fit within, say, a particular class of, of model checking problems that we can solve. Uh, and often when we do that, we have to you know, manually instrument our program uh, in various ways, for example, by adding auxiliary variables or, or applying various transformations to the program. Or we might, for example, be able to do a proof by induction over the number of processes in, in, the, um, in, in the program. And then we'll just ask the model checker to verify the base case and the inductive step of that proof. Okay, so decomposition could mean structural decomposition, or it could mean breaking the proof down to lemmas in different ways. So an example of that that goes way back and actually predates model checking is the idea of a compositional approach. That is somehow we want to break the correctness of a big system down into correctness of each of its individual components. All right? So typically what we'll do is we'll start with a system with components that I've called L. So L is the low level specification or the model. 
right? And we want to prove that it has some high level property H and L consists of a number of components, L1 through L3 in this case. So our proof approach is going to be to give each of those individual components a local specification. So I'll call the local specifications M for the middle level, M1, M2, and M3. And for each component, I'll prove that that, I'll prove that, that component satisfies its local intermediate specification in a completely isolated way, just looking at the one component. And so now I'm doing only local reasoning. And then I'll put all of those abstract specifications together and prove the high level property from that. So that's the sort of classical compositional approach where you prove a property about each component and then you put the properties of the components together to prove something about the whole system. Okay, so. Rupsa asks um, whether any of these um, techniques you just mentioned still ensure that counterexamples are free? In any of the techniques that I just mentioned, are counterexamples still free? Yeah, in, in the last category where you say we throw out the baby. Oh yeah, so in throwing out the baby, the counterexamples are still free, but they're not counterexamples to the big problem, they're counterexamples to the lemma, right? So that's what we've, that's what we've given up, right? Mm -hmm. we've, we've required you now to break your problem down into pieces, and I can now reliably give you a counterexample for each individual piece, or I can give you maybe a counterexample to the proposition that all the intermediate specifications imply the high level. In other words, I can give you a counterexample for each lemma, but I can no longer give you a counterexample for the whole problem. So what you're doing now is to get those properties of model checking that you want, you're paying. And the price you're paying is you're doing some manual proof. And, but still, when you're doing a proof of that form, it's really important to be able to get reliable concrete counterexamples to your lemmas. Otherwise, you, you know, it's very confusing because you don't know if the problem is that the lemma isn't true or the lemma isn't provable. Okay, so the pitfall of doing this kind of thing, right? although it's the only technique that we know that really scales, that really definitely scales, the pitfall, because we're only asking model automated techniques to solve small problems, the pitfall is that while some people find doing proofs to be an entertaining activity, this is not most people. For, for most people, doing proofs gives them a headache, I think with, with good reason. And you know, for some of the reasons probably that Lipton, Perlis, and Demillo were, uh, were talking about. Uh, so this kind of technique is very hard to get, to get used and accepted because of this problem of having to do a part of the proof manually. Okay, so those are, sort of the high level strategies. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is sort of a cross cutting concern. It's an idea that's sort of applied everywhere in model checking. And it's the idea of relaxation. So relaxation is a basic strategy for optimization under constraints. You start with a set of constraints that you don't know how to solve and you relax those constraints by removing some constraint that makes the problem difficult. Then you solve the relaxed problem. And of course, since you haven't solved all the constraints, you might have, you might wind up with a bogus solution. And if you do wind up with a bogus solution, what you're going to do is you're going to add some constraint that will rule out the bad solution. And it will in some way generalize the reason that that was a bad solution. So, the classic exemplar of relaxation is integer linear programming. And I'll talk a little bit about that because it, it sort of helps to explain the, the high level idea. So in, in linear programming, integer, uh, integer linear before programming. You, uh, sorry, uh, before you go ahead into the next bit. Um, so there's a highly upvoted question here asking um, for the throw out the baby strategies. Can you mm -hmm. comment on the uh, amount of additional magic the user usually needs to manually apply? You, well, okay, so, I mean, there, there's two kinds of magic, right? I mean, the, the, when I was talking about magic, I was talking about machine magic, algorithmic magic, right? So in a way, what we're saying is, well, we only have so much algorithmic magic. And if you start pushing towards getting the machine to solve harder and harder problems, you're pushing up against the decidability barrier and the machine is becoming less and less reliable as a result. So in a compositional approach, you're making a trade-off there. You're saying, 
I'm going to let the machine solve problems that it's good at solving. Right? And you know, those might still be NP complete or P space complete problems, but still problems that is relatively, um, which the machine can solve small instances in a reliable way, in a relatively reliable way. But what I'm paying for that is now the human being has to supply some of the magic, right? I have to be able to do that proof decomposition. I have to un be able to understand my automated techniques well enough to break the problem into lemmas that those techniques can handle. And it's an interesting question, you know, how do you provide guidance or feedback to a user in doing, in doing that kind of thing? But um, so, so, you know, as I said, these kinds of techniques, they're, they're very classical. They go, go back and they, they predate model checking, but in a way they haven't had that much practical impact because, you know, applying them is, 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 is you know, cognitively very, very challenging. Yeah. So, okay, so getting back to relaxation. Um, in linear programming, in integer linear programming, you're looking for an integer solution of a set of linear or more properly affine constraints. And your relaxation is to remove the constraint that the solution be integer. So here's an example. The green region here represents a conjunction of three affine constraints that I want to solve. And it contains a number of integer points in, in x1, x2 space. If I remove the integer constraint, I might get a bad solution like the red point, which is at a corner of the, of the polytope, and it's not an integer solution. So if that happens, what I'll do is I will, I will infer a new constraint that eliminates that bad solution and hopefully eliminates a whole class of bad solutions. So in other words, it generalizes from the failure. In this case, to say there are no solutions with x2 greater than 2. Now with that new set of constraints, I may get another non-integer point and so on. And I keep adding these so-called cutting planes to reduce the space of bad solutions. So that's, that's ILP with, uh, with cutting planes. And you can see the most important point is that the cutting plane is a generalization. It doesn't just remove one bad solution, it removes a whole class of bad solutions. So let's look up at how model checking now works, yeah, how relaxation works in the case of model checking. So we can think of either a proof or a counterproof or a counterexample uh, finding such a thing can be thought of as solving a set of constraints. And we can make that search for a proof or a counterexample easier by relaxing the constraints that are making the problem difficult to solve. And there are two ways that we can do this. One is we can relax in the space of counterexamples. In other words, we can take away constraints on the counterexamples, making it easier to find a counterexample. And the classical way of doing that is called counterexample guided abstraction refinement. So in other words, we abstract the system, which means we're reducing the space of proofs, which in turn increases the space of counterexamples. One way we could abstract is just throwing away what we know about a particular component of a system, or we could throw away an axiom or whatever we like. So let's suppose now that we get a counterexample that's bogus. It's not a real counterexample of the pro uh, for the property in the system. Well, we're going to refine now by adding additional constraints on the counterexamples. For example, adding a new axiom or considering an additional component of the system. Okay, so we are starting out by increasing the space of counterexamples and then gradually narrowing it down. And that's, for example, CGAR. On the other hand, we can also relax in the space of proofs. That is, we can allow some bogus proofs and if we do get a bogus proof, then we can sort of increase the space of possible counterproofs. And some examples of, those of, of such a technique would be, say, interpolation-based methods or incremental induction methods, where you may look for a proof that only talks about bounded executions of the system. And if it doesn't turn out to be inductive, if it doesn't turn out to be a proof of arbitrary length executions, then you know, we can refine by looking at longer and longer executions until we finally do get a proof. So as I noted with, with integer programming, refinement always requires some kind of generalization. And really the key to doing it is to, having a good, is to have a good heuristic for generalization. So you don't go into an infinite sequence of tiny refinements. And you know, just an observation here, relaxation is often useful after lowering expectations 
especially if we want to prove some shallow properties of a system like it doesn't execute a null dereference, then relaxation might be a very good technique uh, uh, to use because we might be able to use a very coarse relaxation to solve that problem. So a good example for understanding the idea of relaxation in model checking is something that's called ice learning. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, we're we want to prove a safety property of a transition system by finding an inductive invariant. And in an inductive invariant has to satisfy three constraints. It has to satisfy the initiation condition, which means it's true of all the initial states of the system. It has to satisfy consecution, which means every transition of the system preserves the inductive invariant. And it has to satisfy safety, which means that it implies some safety condition. It implies that some bad thing doesn't happen in the current state. So we're looking for a formula that has those three properties, but this is a very hard set of constraints to satisfy. So what we do in ice learning is we relax the problem and we make it easier. So instead of having those three constraints for the whole system, we'll just put in some much simpler constraints. We'll give some particular initial states that the invariant has to contain. We'll give some particular bad states that the invariant has to not contain. Okay, so those are both constraints on the invariant. And we'll give some particular transitions that the invariant has to preserve. In other words, in the transition, if the invariant is true of the pre-state, it must also be true of the post-state, or the transition doesn't go outside the invariant. So now with that simple set of constraints, we can throw it at our solver and we might come up with a formula. And that formula represents a certain space of the states that contains all the initial states. None of our transitions escape from it and it doesn't contain any bad states. So we solve the relaxed constraints but we might find that it's a bogus proof. It's not a real proof because there's a transition of, of my system that goes from the inside to the outside, which means it's not inductive. So what we do then, of course, is we refine by adding that transition to our set of constraints. We throw it into our solver, and now maybe the solver will come up with a new solution that's okay for that transition. And eventually we hope to converge by ruling out the bad proofs. We hope to converge to a good proof. Okay, so you can think about a lot of techniques as operating in that way. Uh, for example, IC3 or interpolation and so on can be thought of as relaxation in the space of proofs in, in addition to, uh, to ice learning. But it's the same essential concept. The only difference is, am I doing it on the proof side or am I doing it on the counter, counter example side? So the pitfall of this kind of technique is you have to have a good generalization heuristic. And usually that involves what we call some kind of inductive bias, some, some kind of bias towards formulas that are more likely to be invariants, let's say. Otherwise, relaxation can lead to an infinite sequence of small refinements. Okay, so we've looked at a number of problems in the model checking, within the model checking paradigm, and we've looked at strategies for resolving them, right? We have apply magic, which means algorithmic, algorithmically try to get around intractability, give and take away, which means try to just cozy up to the decidability boundary, lower expectations, which is obvious, and throw out the baby, which means get the human to help in the proof. Okay? And when you look at any given paper now that relates to model checking at CAP or somewhere else, you can ask, what are the basic strategies that they're applying to solve problems within the paradigm? And you can also ask, is there a relaxation occurring and what kind of relaxation is it? And if so, what is the, generaliz what is the generalization heuristic that they're using? In other words, why are they hoping to be able to generalize well? And this is, these are questions that you can ask about a lot of CAF papers to try to understand at a high level what's going on in the paper. And you can also ask about the paper, if you want to be more critical, has the paper successfully avoided the strategy's pitfalls you know, that, I was, that I was describing. In other words, has the paper found a useful compromise among these five criteria, or has it, has it won the game of whack-a-mole, if you want? Uh, and ultimately, you can ask, does it help to solve that original problem right, from the 1970s, that is the fact that proofs are hard, or perhaps is it just pushing the hardness of proofs into some other paper or some other technique. Okay, so um, 
Conclusions. You could think of model checking as a technique, but model checking is, can also be viewed as a paradigm. In other words, as a collection of unresolved problems and correspondingly a collection of strategies for solving those problems. Right. And you, uh, it, and uh, so, right. So, in other words, it's an approach to formulating or solving a problem. And if all of the problems are solved within a research paradigm, of course, it's not research anymore, right? In other words, re research is defined by a collection of unresolved problems. And if you look at the history of model checking, everything that I talked about in this paper almost was really established and fully in place by around. 1990, or a little bit after. Actually, relaxation techniques took a little longer to come into uh, to come into use, but so that paradigm has been in place for a long time at, at this point. So, if you've read Thomas Kuhn, you know you know that the inability to resolve certain problems within a research paradigm eventually leads to the overthrow of that paradigm, and that's called a paradigm shift. So, another thing that you can ask yourself when reading a paper. Right? or when thinking about research ideas in this area is, is there anything there that looks to you like the seed of a new paradigm? Is there anything that falls outside this paradigm that might point to a way of escaping eventually this, this game of model checking whack-a-mole? So thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks, Ken. Uh, we have some more questions also if you're listening in and uh, have any more questions, please put it on the Slido. We have some time. No, I'm not. I'm not here. Hello. Okay, I'm. I'm still getting some, some audio breakup uh, here. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. One. Uh, Sarah asks um, basically that all the strategies presented seem to have major pitfalls and do you have any advice on how to deal with the trade-offs? Yeah, well, okay. So in a way, right. So this is getting the point of the talk, right? The point of the talk is that all the strategies have major pitfalls. In other words, that there are fundamental unresolved problems. And so I think that the, the way to think about this is you're not going to escape fundamental problems of computational complexity, for example. Uh, and uh, you know, ultimately, you're, you're not going to be able to reliably scale algorithmic techniques for solving, uh, for solving hard problems, for solving undecidable problems. So the way you want to think about this is really, have you made an appropriate set of compromises such that, that this technique can be used in a particular, in some particular domain to solve some particular problem? And you know, a thing that I like to try to think about is, let's suppose that I'm successful, you know, working along this this particular line of, of research. So I'm working on, say, interpolation techniques, and suppose that they work as well as you know I could I could possibly hope that they would. Then what would it allow someone to do? Could someone who was doing a proof of a large system somehow use that technique, you know, to solve their problem, or is you know? the problem of translating the proof into a form that my technique uh, can solve, is that problem in itself so hard that the technique is just not going to get used? In other words, you want to ask, have you made the right, have you made a reasonable set of compromises within some particular application domain, right? So, so that you can say that this technique is going to be, is going to be helpful within that, within that domain. And you know, because obviously, you know, we we can hope to have you know full, fully automated proofs of arbitrarily complex software, but you know, realistically, I don't think that's going to happen. And we have to think. I think we need to think more in terms of what is the high-level methodology that's going to use all of those techniques, and then we can decide if we have won the game of of whack-a-mole or or not. Um, thank you. Um... Yeah, they, they, well, um, Augustine asks the, I think he's asking the question back. Uh, it's, do you currently see any new, uh, uh, any seed of a new paradigm in the verification community? 
Uh -huh. Yeah, well, this is interesting. So, so there have been um, various sorts of ways that, that, that um, yeah, that, that, that people have tried to, to escape, right, from, from this set of sort of, sort of invidious trade-offs, you know, and you could say, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to uh, look at, um, you know, just, just probabilities, you know, I'll do stochastic uh, model checking and, and, and thereby I, I'll escape. Um, and, you know, I don't think that any of those things fundamentally will do it. In other words, we, we have to think about, we, we really have to think in terms of engineering, right? Not in terms of algorithms. In other words, can we build an engineering methodology that will allow us to design a certain, of cl certain class of systems with a certain set of techniques or, or technologies? And, and that that's really, you know, that's you know, looking at the larger picture is, is, is really the, the solution to this. And looking outside of, um, uh, you know, looking outside of just solving a collection of, of benchmark problems. Is the is the uh, is the solution to this, but um, but so but to really the answer answer the question, I would have to say no, or at least no magic, and you know that that's that's the thing. I don't I don't see that I don't see the way out of of the particular set of conundra that are involved in in uh, in uh, model checking. But this was another uh, nice quote that. Um, uh, I think I think Rupak uh, uh, mentioned this. He, he said that you know science advances one funeral at a time, right? So, so I'm, I'm hoping you know that the the younger generation of researchers will will be able to you know to to break the paradigm you know and uh, and, and in a different way forward when you know the old uh, when us old people are are gone. So. Well, we could probably put it the other way and say science advances one graduation at a time. To put a more right. You could put it positively or negatively. But you see what I'm saying? It takes it. it you know, it, the 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 people who are too much, um, who are too closely involved in the field for too long, right, are are are, are just going to have a harder time seeing their way out of the uh, uh, of of the assumptions that have been made, right? That, that might be that might be unnecessary or, or just or just maybe too conservative. So so whether it's funerals or graduations, the you know the point is a fresh set of eyes, a different uh, a different perspective, being willing to throw out very precious ideas, right, is, is really the thing. Okay. So uh, okay. yeah. There's another question here that asks about um, undecidability and complexity. So the question says, do you think that a problem being undecidably, undec undecidable shouldn't necessarily discourage tackling it? Uh, the example here is terminate the checking termination for a large fraction of the cases. Okay, so I, there's actually a, a criterion that, that I would use for that. Right? And the question is, do you care if you solve the problem? Right? And, and that, that sounds a little bit facetious, but what I mean is, if you're solving an undecidable problem, it's worse than solving an intractable problem. In other words, because you're going to have to use heuristics that become less and less reliable. Uh, so, you know, even say just first order logic is, is undecidable. You know, it's complete, but it's undecidable. You can't be sure if, uh, you know, you don't have some, you know, some infinite model. So you can't always give counterexamples. Um, and so it's fine to attack the undecidable problem so long as you're happy when you get an answer and you're not unhappy when you don't get an answer. Now, if what you're doing is you're constructing a larger proof, you know, in the way that I was describing, maybe a compositional proof, then unfortunately you are unhappy when you don't get an answer because when you don't get an answer, you're stuck. Right? You have to get some kind of feedback that tells you when you're wrong and how you can, uh, how you can move forward by correcting or adjusting your proof. So as part of a larger methodology, solving undecidable problems is, is not something that I would recommend. If, on the other hand, you're just looking for bugs, you know, and you're happy with warnings that a certain piece of code might not, uh, might not terminate, then, uh, then that's fine, right? Then it doesn't matter that the technique is very unreliable. But, but in other contexts, you care about things like the fact that 
if it gave an answer yesterday and you made some tiny change, like you renamed a variable or you commuted an addition, and now it doesn't solve the problem because the heuristics fail. Right? This is okay in some contexts and it's bad in other contexts. So that goes back to what I was saying before about having to think about the larger context to decide if you've really solved the problem or not. Yeah, um, maybe we have time for one or two more last two more questions. I guess one is good. Uh, so there's a question here about machine learning. Um, machine learning seems to be causing paradigm shifts in many areas of computer science. Can you speculate what it may do to model checking? What machine learning can do for model checking or what model checking can do for machine learning, right? Um, so, so what machine learning can do for uh, model checking, I mean, you remember that I talked about, um, about generalization heuristics. So I think machine learning can teach us a lot about general, generalization heuristics how to generalize, right? How to understand, you know, the space of hypotheses that you're using and, and, and so on. And I think that, um, you know, as, a, uh, as in the apply magic category, right? Well, machine learning is the magic du jour, right? So you should always take, you should always take the current magic, you know, and, and, and see, what it, see what it can give you because it might give you back answers, you know, in some cases. On the other hand, if you look at machine learning, in, in the case of machine learning, people have been willing to tolerate a lot of um, instability. Right? In other words, uh, you know, you have cases where, you know, let's say that you're identifying, you know, cats versus dogs on, you know, the internet and in images on the internet or something like that. As long as you don't care that much about the, the fact that it's really unstable and if you change a few pixels in the image, then you get a wrong answer, then that's okay. Right. And you know that might be the case in in some applications of formal methods as as well, but you know when you start using um, uh, when you start using learned models to do things like say driving autonomous vehicles, then you know you might actually care about the fact that the thing is 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 unstable and that it uh, frequently you know tiny changes produce uh, and the inputs produce big changes in the outputs and so on. So, you know, I, I think that as long as we can tolerate that in applications where we can tolerate that, then, you know, using machine learning to try to come up with artifacts, you know, be it inductive invariance or, or any sort of piece of a proof seems, you know, very, uh, seems very promising and useful. But of course, we, you know, we'd also like to go the other way, you know, and say, what can, what can formal methods do for, uh, 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 do for um, machine learning? And I think there we have, we have a long way to go, right? To understand even even what it means to apply formal verification in in uh, the kinds of applications in in the places that, that machine learning is uh, is is used. But but this is, um, you know, I think that this is still a great a great area. And so I've been I've been working on some things that involve using interpolants for um, uh, not for verifying neural networks, but for actually explaining their behavior. And I think that. You know, because of the, some of the things that I talked about, I mean, if you look at look at those things, you can you can see that they are related to machine learning. You know, they have to do with generalization. Right? And so, so can the lessons that can the things that we know about generalization be used in in machine learning? I think the answer is probably yes, and that that's also a very uh, 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 you know a, a very promising uh, a, a very promising research area, a very promising way forward. Okay, um, I think we are out of time. Uh, thanks, Ken, and there's been some uh, really positive um, reactions to your talk. Uh, Sattar, she says, it's a fantastic talk. I already feel more prepared to study model checking in detail. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Exactly what I want. Okay, thank you, Arjun. Yeah, so, okay. Um, let's move on to the next talk. Um, so our uh, second speaker this session is um, Ranjit Jala. Ranjit is a professor at University of uh, California, San Diego, and he's a scholar at Amazon. Uh, his work draws and contributes to the areas of model checking, program analysis, automated deduction, and type systems. 
Uh, Ranjit has made a number of key contributions to the field, including uh, lazy abstraction and the blast verification tool, uh, liquid types, and the, and the instantiation liquid Haskell. And for these and other contributions, Ranjit received uh, the 2018 Robin Milner Young Researcher Award. Um, also, he's the star of several music videos, which you might want to look up. And uh, he gives great talks, and let us now learn how, how to give talks from him. Um, let's see if I can get my screen working. Can you all see my screen? Uh, yes. Uh, let's see, can I see my screen? That's an equally crucial part in all this. Okay, give me one second while I get all... My screen is covered by various Zoom-related things, which I can't seem to get rid of. Oh, well, I just have to live with it. Um, hang on. Oh, hang on. Let's see. Give me a moment. Hide that video. I don't want you. I'm just trying to hide a bunch of things. Hide the video panel. What else can I hide? Hide the floating meeting controls. Fantastic. Okay. Very good. I think now you can still see me. Is it all good? Yes. Ah. Okay, yes. good. I, I just like blocked everything else out. So I, I don't know if you're there. Okay, well, thank you, Arjun, and um, all the organizers of VMW for inviting me to this, uh, to give this talk. Um, I feel very much on the spot, uh, not least because it occurs to me that um, the first CAV I, I, I went to was 20 years ago. And it was in fact, um, a paper that I wrote with Ken. Um, you know, this was in the cave in Paris a long time ago. So I'm feeling like I'm, I'm feeling very squirmy right now. Ken, you should just switch off this thing because I'm just going to feel strange otherwise. Um, anyway, so I, I want to, you know, I, um, I guess Rupak made this remark. It's a kind of a, um, you know, one, one gets these invitations to speak at mentoring workshops. Uh, they really are, you know, with mixed feelings because, um, it's really like, what am I, what, what kind of advice am I going to give people? So I, I thought the one thing I, I can talk about since I kind of um, care about it a lot is, is just how to prepare talks. So let me, before I jump into how one prepares talks or how I think about preparing talks, let me tell you a little bit about, very briefly about myself. I've been, um, I've been at UC San Diego for the last 15 years. And before that, I did my PhD in, in Berkeley. And I worked on BLAST and, and so on, as Arjun uh, just pointed out. And, you know, I've, I've worked with a bunch of students that I'm very proud of, all of whom sort of heard the same spiel that I'm going to be giving you right now. Um, and as Arjun pointed out, uh, what I'm probably most notorious for these days are some of these YouTube videos, one of which has this particular refrain. You can probably Google and, and look it up. But one of the things that I really, really obsess about is talks. And I'm a bit of a kind of a talk nerd, and I hope to kind of convey some of the reasons why I obsess about talks, uh, but also, you know, a, almost a, a f like how I think you should go about preparing talks in the first place. Okay, I, I find myself giving the same advice again and again, so I thought it makes sense to put it into a, a set of slides. So first of all, I want to emphasize this point. Okay, why should you obsess about giving talks? So. I obsess for whatever my reasons are, but why do I think you or anybody else should obsess? And this advice is not just for people who are, you know, doing PhDs or whatever, right? Even if you're an undergraduate and you, you know, maybe you choose to go to graduate school, maybe you don't. No matter where you go, what you do with your life, you will find that you will pretty much have to communicate some ideas to other people, right? And the best way to go about doing that is in a talk, right? Um, and in a sense, this, this gentleman summed it up. So he's one of the kind of uh, computing pioneers from you know a long time ago, Howard Aiken. He was one of the lead architects and the designers of, if I recall, the ENIAC. And Howard Aiken said, don't worry about people stealing an idea. If the idea is at all any good, you will have to ram it down their throats. Okay. And so in a sense, the reason that I obsess about giving talks is because a talk, like right now, is the best opportunity that you have to sort of take ideas or you know take any notions that you have and ram it down people's throats. Okay, you have a large and captive audience. Now, 
what do you want to do with this captive audience well it depends you know for many of the talks that you'll see at cav or you know similar kind of uh, academic conferences you want to get people excited about your research okay so you want to kind of make you want to craft your talk the best way possible to get people excited about whatever your idea is um maybe if they get excited they'll become collaborators they'll want to work with you maybe you have a tool that you you're you're building and you want other people to be using this tool and at the very least these are the same people who might you know several years down the line or six months down the line or you know two weeks down the line might have positions to offer you maybe they're you know maybe they're academics like me who are looking to hire phd students maybe they're people at companies who are looking to hire new engineers or new researchers all of these are reasons why you should really really pay attention um to giving talks as well as you possibly can right now that's all well and good but how does one actually go about giving a good talk okay what are what are the kind of the main what are the main ingredients so i'm going to argue that there are roughly speaking three parts the first is before you can go about you know thinking about your talk in the first place is the business of creating the content for your talk what are you going to talk about in the first place and in a sense i'm not going to talk about this okay the second part is what i'm going to focus on is let's imagine that you already have a good idea of what your talk is about you've done the research you've built the tool you have whatever idea that you want to promote and proselytize about what you really want to focus on now is how do i craft my talk itself to kind of get the message out but there's a third equally important sort of aspect uh, equally important limb which is how to deliver the talk and once again i'm not going to talk about this right so the the one thing that i'm going to focus on over the next uh, whatever 30 or so minutes 40 minutes is just going to be how do you focus on the actual design of the talk um and 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 that's it okay but i just want to emphasize that that doesn't mean the other two things are unimportant um i think they're extremely important it's just that they are sort of subject matter for a different talk and i'm not really going to focus on them i'll touch a little bit on them uh, towards the end of the talk Okay great so how to design talks right now whenever you see the word design in my opinion the first thing you have to think about is what is the purpose of the design what are we trying to achieve like what is the what is the objective what is our goal in a talk so one goal i have already mentioned right is you have this captive audience of people um you know sitting at home right now but if you, if it was at a conference they're squirming in their chairs inside a inside a hotel or whatever right they're waiting to receive wisdom from you so you really want to spread your ideas or what not but there is a secondary goal which is you want to avoid losing people to the thousand other things that they might be looking at instead of your talk okay it might be candy crush so if if you were all sitting in a hotel right now or in a university lecture uh, lecture hall you could have you have two choices you can either listen to me kind of harangue sort of go on at you about how to design talks or you could whip out your phone and check your facebook feed or see if somebody tweeted another funny cat picture or you could go and play candy crush these are all things that i could lose you to right if you're at home you can just like all tab out of this and go and switch on netflix so in a sense we were we were having a discussion at um, over a break this morning in these kind of in this new online era era things are even harder you have to pay that much more effort uh, into making your talk because the opportunities for distraction for the audience are that much greater right so the goal is yes we want to spread our wisdom but without losing to candy crush and so to me the way i think about designing a talk is the central goal is how do i how do i help the people who are trying to pay attention to pay attention how do i help them to focus on the content that i want them to focus on without getting lost because the moment you get you get lost the moment somebody tunes out they fell off the wagon and that's gone okay so to me this is going to be the principal kind of the prime objective uh, as it were how can you eliminate opportunities for audience members to get lost So now there's you know when I when I thought about okay great so I I got as far as I'm going to get to this point right um I my primary goal is how to enable focus now let me go and look up the kind of what is the general wisdom you know that people have accumulated over the you know millennia as it were on how to prepare talks and I came across this um I came across this sort of advice that was attributed to Aristotle the the Greek philosopher from you know a long time ago And Aristotle apparently said that the way you design talks, he has a very simple three-step process. Step one, tell them what you will tell them. Step two, tell them, and then step three, tell them what you just told them. 
Okay, so this is Aristotle saying: you sort of prime the pump, then you do the thing, and then you tell them what you just told them. So I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. I guess that's one way to do it. But there's a couple of flaws with uh, with Aristotle's plan. The first flaw is that it was not Aristotle at all. Apparently, who came up with this? It was an English pastor who wrote this kind of newsletter back in 1908, before the era of blogs and tweets. One just wrote newsletters to one's parishioners or whatever, right? And he wrote this article called The Three Parts of a Sermon. And apparently for him, the three parts of a sermon were literally these. Tell them what you will tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you just told them. So this is one problem, right, with this advice. The second problem with this, uh, with this advice is um, it's a bit like this particular meme that you might have seen on the internet, right? How to draw an owl. Step one, draw some circles. You can see where these circles are, right? The top circle is kind of probably the head and the lower circle is the body. And then step two, draw the rest of the freaking out. Okay, so this, um, this this is I guess useful, but it's not terribly. It's not. It's really not what we call actionable advice. So I sort of threw this aside and sort of went back to the drawing board a little bit and thought, okay, well, how do I go about designing talks? And this is the kind of recipe that I came up with. Okay, so the recipe is roughly something like this. First, before you actually get into the business of the talk, you have to think about what is the story that you want to tell. Okay, so think of it as what is the outline of the talk. Okay, before I fire up PowerPoint or Keynote or Beamer or what have you, just think about what is the outline? What is the point I'm trying to make? Second, once I have the whole story, I think of how can I take that entire story and break it up into individual scenes? Okay. And you can think of each, each of these scenes as kind of sections of a paper or sections of a talk. And then finally, once I've broken the story into individual scenes, how do I then render, how do I flesh out a whole scene um, as a sequence of frames? And you can think of a frame as literally one single slide, okay? So I'm gonna use this, this kind of this rubric of story, scene, and frame as the outline for my talk. Okay, so I'm going to sort of walk you through how I think about designing talks by walking you through this through this kind of three step process of first designing the story, then designing scenes and then designing frames. So let me pause at this point and see if um, if there are any questions. Yes, there's a there's a remark. Perhaps Aristotle would fail to give talks in the time of Candy Crush. I don't know. I'm pretty sure. I'm sure Aristotle had a pretty tough crowd back when he, you know back when uh, back when he was preaching as well. Okay, so let's jump in. And let's look at what is it, you know, how do you think about what the story is in the first place? Okay. So I should point out uh, before I go any further that this talk is also, um, what, is the, what is the somewhat pretentious way to say it? it works at many levels. Uh, what I mean is that the talk itself is an example, obviously, of how I think you should make talks, right? So I'm going to be using the talk itself as a kind of example as I go along. So uh, returning to the subject of the story, so as I said, how do you how do you find the story, right? How do you come up with what your story is? Now, some of this is dictated by what is the content, you know, what is it that you want to talk about, right? So I want to talk about how to design talks. But then what you do is you first identify what is the goal? What is the message that I want? What new insight or idea or notion do I want people in the audience to come away with after having seen my talk? Okay, the, identify the key ideas that you want to have rammed down. And then you think of the story as a kind of trajectory or a path to that particular goal. Okay, so I have whatever goal I want to achieve. And now the story is, is a kind of an arc or a path towards that goal. Okay, that gets you to that goal. So typically in a kind of research focused talk, for example, you would have some problem, right? This is the state of the world right now. We know how to do X, Y, Z, but we do, know, do not know how to do PQR. And here is my magic algorithm or magic solution or magic idea or magic tool that achieves whatever that solution is, right? So you want to think of your path or your story as uh, a path to that particular solution. So now, well, the next question is, that's very good. We're still in this kind of draw the rest of the freaking owl type of uh, situation, right? So there's a problem, there's a solution, but what makes for a good path? How do I know if a story is any good? So the way I think about designing this path is, the, is first, how do you even specify the path, right? So we're like at CAV, we're all sort of formal methods people, everything's about specification. How do you even just specify this very informal idea of a path and how do you make it a little more rigorous, a little more formal um, uh, to get you sort of closer towards your actual talk? The way you do so is the same way, for example, 
Google Maps tells you when you ask it for a path from wherever your house is to wherever the nearest beach is or wherever the nearest ski slope is or wherever the nearest hiking trail is, whatever it is one can do in this, uh, in this, in this kind of COVID era, right? The way you specify a path is by identifying landmarks along that path, okay? So think of these landmarks as intermediate sort of stepping stones that get you from the problem to the solution. Okay, so these landmarks sort of break up the entire path into smaller pieces. Well, this begs the question then, uh, in, my, in my particular example, what was my problem, what were my solution, and what were my landmarks? Well, let me give you a concrete example, right? What was my goal, if you recall, if you were paying attention, my goal was that I have a fickle audience that is itching to get away from me and bust open Netflix or Candy Crush. And my solution is to somehow explain to you how to give talks without losing this fickle audience uh, to these far more exciting uh, attractions. And the way that I broke up my path was uh, via these three landmarks, right? The first landmark was, I broke it down, I'm going to tell you about this notion of a story. Once I tell you about the story, I'm then going to tell you about individual scenes, and then I'm going to tell you about these frames. Okay, so I'm sort of breaking my path up into these particular uh, set of three landmarks that will get you from fickle audience and show you how to enable focus. Okay, great. Now, why did I pick these landmarks? Why are these landmarks any good? How do you know? Like, what are, what are some heuristics, if you wish, uh, for picking good landmarks, right? So I think there's a couple, I don't, I don't want to say there's an, there's an immediate recipe, but there's a couple of tests, perhaps, that you can do uh, that will allow you to determine if the set of landmarks you have are good ones or not. So here's the first and most basic test for a landmark, right? Is definition before use. So what that means is you must always tell me about your the problem that you're trying to solve before you tell me about the solution. It doesn't, otherwise I just cannot understand the solution. Similarly, I told you about stories before I told you about scenes and I told you about scenes before I told you about frames because there's a kind of dependency there that I want to respect, okay? I always want to give you intuition before formalism. I don't want to like give you a bunch of definitions, a bunch of theorems and then explain why that works. That, that simply does not work. Why, again, comes back to enable focus, right? The moment you give me something that I'm not primed to receive, I'm going to lose focus, candy crush, here I come. Okay, but, and now this is another, um, it's, a, it, it's cool that I'm giving this talk right after Ken because I, I, this insight that I, you know, this particular idea that I have about how you organize your landmarks, is, it comes from, a, you know, it's like classic work that Ken did like 20 years ago and it has not to do with talks at all, but it has to do with binary decision diagrams. And where in binary decision diagrams, uh, for those of you, you know, who don't know it, you have to order the variables in a very particular way so that they don't blow up. And what Ken and his colleagues showed is that, you know, there are various clever ways that you do this because if you don't do it the right way, the bandwidth just blows up and your binary decision diagram blows up. So as with binary decision diagrams, so with talks, okay, you want to minimize the amount of state that each member of the audience has to keep in their brains. Okay, because we're all, you know, at the end of the day, we're all automata of one form or another, right? So imagine this is the passage of time from left to right. And I've said, you must put definitions before use, but here is something that does not work. I put a bunch of definitions up in the first five minutes, and then I only use those definitions in the last five minutes. So now what is this notion of bandwidth? What bandwidth means is that the poor audience member has to remember all these four definitions at this intermediate point, right? So the bandwidth is like this four different ideas. I have, I have this massive memory where I have somehow remember all these four different ideas for the future of the talk to even make sense. And this is not minimizing bandwidth, okay? The bandwidth is very high. It's very likely that somewhere in the middle, the audience member is like, oh, I've forgotten what's going on. I give up, Candy Crush, here I come, okay? Instead, it is profitable often to reorder your landmarks so that you can minimize bandwidth. Now look at this. I put the, I've sort of interleaved the definitions and the uses. And so at each point, if each, each definition was one of these blue landmarks and a use was a purple landmark, I just have to remember one thing at a particular point. Okay, I just remember one definition and then I can forget about it and I can move on to the next landmark. Okay? So that's one heuristic to keep in mind as you think about your landmarks. You want to make it very easy for people to not have to remember everything you said in the past, just remember one little summary of everything that came before. Second, with your, when you're thinking about landmarks, you should always remember this, okay? That 
in talks, this is kind of true in papers, but really it's true in, in, in kind of more in talks, which have this more linear structure, right? That you have to, uh, that you have to preserve over your 30 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever it is. There's a kind of V-shaped complexity, and this is what I mean. Again, here is time. And on the y-axis, I have the percentage of the audience paying attention. And you know, I have deliberately left scales off. Okay. Now, this is what the graph looks like. It looks roughly like this. Okay. At the very beginning of your talk, everyone is paying attention. Like, hmm, here's a here's a talk. This sounds like an interesting title. Everyone's kind of clued in, right? But as time progresses, you're gonna lose people. It's it's just it's like gravity. Okay, you will lose people. Some people are going to not follow or whatnot. Siren song of Candy Crush and so on. But then as time again uh, passes and you get towards the end of your talk, people will again kind of check back in. Hmm, do they have something to say? And so you want to design your landmarks that way too. You want to start with very high level motivation. That's something that everybody's going to understand. Some, if you have some very high level bit, for example, my high level bit is you want to design your talk so that people are allowed, are able to maintain focus. I really want everybody to get that. I put that, I front load that. I keep it right at the beginning. Then you want to gradually ratchet up the detail, right? You can gradually make things more technical. You can't suddenly jump off a cliff. As you lose people, that's fine. It's fine to gradually increase the complexity of whatever it is you're going to talk about, a technical detail and so on. But then again, as you sort of start getting towards the end of your talk, you want to pop up to a high level summary, maybe a high level discussion of the consequences that even if you skip the middle bits, but you don't really know, I, I didn't follow all the technical details in the middle, people can still can get something useful out of your talk. Okay, so this is the, a second heuristic that you have to keep in mind. Before we go ahead, there's a yes. question. Of course, yes, please, yeah. Arjun. Actually, if I may yeah. pause, can you hold the questions? I'm just going to transition to uh, in, in a second. Okay. And then maybe we can get to a question in like two seconds. Sure, sure. sure. Okay, I'll just pause and I'll, I'll let you uh, see a question, okay? So my, my, the third thing that I would say about a landmark, and this is a really useful test because it's very concrete. I mean, everything, V-shaped complexity, definition before use, these are kind of nebulous. The third thing that I, I, I always tell my students when you're designing your landmarks is you ask, your que ask yourself the question, can you use your landmarks as the outline for your talk? Okay, so for example, I am using my landmarks as the outline for my talk, the title, how to design talks. My three landmarks are stories, then the scene, then the frame. Is it possible for me to use this as the outline? And I want to do this for several reasons. One, it's a good test of are these the three highest ideas? Are these the most important landmarks along the way? Second, and this is crucial and comes back to enabling focus, repetition, because you're going to keep coming back to this outline, as you will see in a second, I'll come back to it in like the, my very next slide. The repetition is going to reinforce these landmarks. And it allows people that if you did get lost, maybe I forgot what he was talking about when he was talking about the story, whatever, no matter, he was talking about something to do with stories, I forgot about the details of it. But now I can get back on the wagon. You know, I can, if somebody did lose focus, I can kind of pull them back on the wagon and and allow, allow them to follow the, the, the part of the talk from then onwards, okay? Okay, so how to pick landmarks? One, make sure you put your definitions before use. Two, so try to highlight this V-shaped complexity and see if it works as a particular outline. Okay, so let me pause here now, uh, Arjun, and take some questions. <clears throat> Whoops, did I lose Arjun? No, I, I'm here, oh, sorry. Good, good, um, yeah. Yeah, we have one question here that asks, uh, should a paper presentation differ from the paper layout itself? Like, Should uh, the paper presentation differ from the layout? Aha, paper also has a problem. Excellent, very good. Um, absolutely. Uh, the short answer is yes, for several reasons. So uh, the, the short answer is actually yes and no. So even in, so there are some commonalities between a paper and a talk. So for example, this V-shaped complexity that I showed you, there's a lot of that in, in, in papers as well. So there is an absolutely amazing talk by Simon Peyton Jones on how to write papers, um, where he makes this point that, look, there's a kind of power law distribution. A thousand people will read your abstract, a hundred people will read your introduction, 10 people will read your section two and so on and so forth, right? So there is this kind of V-shaped thing. And so again, you want to front load the juiciest, highest level bits in a paper as well as in a talk. There is one major difference though between a paper and uh, a talk, but I should say, 
this difference is getting blurred in the online era, but we'll talk about that later. The main difference is in a paper, you can kind of easily flip forwards and backwards in a paper. You can put hyperlinks in a paper where you can put in a link, oh, we're going to explain this there. Or, you know, this business about minimizing state, it doesn't really matter because you can just say, as we explained in section three, go back and look in section three. You're like, oh, okay, you can come back and continue on section six, right? But that's harder to do if you have this kind of linear progression that you have in a typical talk. Now, I should say this breaks down, this analogy sort of, uh, or this distinction breaks down in the in the talk I'm giving right now, because yes, you can't, well, you can actually, you can like rewind this YouTube live stream right now and see what I was talking about and then come back, right? But in a, in a live talk, you can't rewind and fast forward. So that's one major difference. So what I would say is that even in a paper, you're sort of, I often like to write a section two of a paper, which is very much which very much mirrors the structure of the conference talk that I would write. So if you want to understand what this paper is about in like one hour or whatever, 25 minutes, read section two. And the structure of section two often mirrors what's in the talk. But other than that, there's a lot of difference because, you know, um, in the, really, I think of the talk as a kind of, as an advertisement for the paper. I want to kind of induce you into reading the paper. And so in the paper, you have a lot more room to expound on a lot more detail about lots of different things. So that's primarily the difference. Right? And you don't have this forced linear constraint. Okay, good. Uh, and there's various other differences. Maybe we can come back to this question later, actually, Saptarshi, because it's it's a very interesting one. Okay, good. So that was that was the story. That's the overall arc. But we still, you know, that that only gets us part of the way towards your talk. The next thing I want to talk about is how do you now, you know, given your overall arc, how do you break your talk up into individual scenes? Okay, whoa, hang on, I appear to have, gosh, there we go. So first of all, what is a scene? So continuing with my, uh, with my kind of topological analogy, I think of a scene as essentially a short path between two landmarks, okay? And I want to sort of, I, again, the purpose of the talk is to sort of show you this path. And as I said, I want to describe, I want to show you the path visually. I don't want to tell you, I don't want to use words. I really want to use pictures. So the one thing, well, there's lots of one things, but one thing you must take away from this is that if your talk is only examples, then that's fine. You know, this obviously doesn't fly in a research paper, but in a talk, if it's just like 90% examples, your audience will thank you for it. Just concrete examples of what it is that you're talking about. So in the spirit of examples, let me illustrate what I mean by a scene, uh, you know, using various examples, right? So to me, a scene is going to be a sequence of transitions, and this is important, it's a sequence of transitions, it's a kind of a whole, you know, temporal sequence. It's not a set of slides. Do not think of it as just, you know, one slide followed by another slide. Think of the entire sequence as a kind of an atomic thing, which is what I'm calling the scene. And the purpose of this sequence is to show the audience member whatever the next landmark is. Remember, we're going from one landmark to the next landmark to the next landmark. The purpose of this sequence of transitions or a scene is to show the audience the next landmark, ideally via an example, okay? So how are we gonna build up a scene? Again, I'm giving you some general heuristics. The first thing I like to do is, you know, I, I, I know what the landmark is at this point, right? So I wanna think of an example that illustrates this landmark because I like talks to be super example driven. And in order to do so, what I first do is I think of the complete example. Okay, I almost think of, I design my scenes backwards. So think of an ideal, perfect, complete example. And there are some properties of this ideal example. So this, uh, the, the properties to me of this ideal example are best, uh, are best sort of uh, specified by, uh, by the little prince, right? In the little prince, the author writes, perfection is achieved not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. Okay, so you want to like strip away, strip away as much kind of extraneous detail from your example as you possibly can, leaving behind just the minimal thing that is needed to illustrate whatever landmark it is that you want to illustrate. Okay, so what I do is I try to find that complete example it should identify exactly what it is I want that landmark to show and nothing else. And there are some properties. There are other properties of this ideal perfect example, right? It should fit, it should, it should show all the essential elements. It should fit nicely on a slide, right? It should be as simple as possible and should fit, you know, it should fit on a single slide. And then what I do, having identified the complete example, is I work backwards. 
Okay, I say, okay, I want to build up to that particular example. How can I keep building up to it by, what is the last thing I want to add? So I want to sort of take away pieces one by one, one by one, one by one, until I sort of start with nothing, and then it gradually builds up to whatever that complete example was. And then my scene is, of course, going to be the sequence of transitions working forwards that builds up to the landmark, okay? But the point I want to emphasize is it's often much easier to start by, you know, to design your scene itself by starting at the end, throwing away all the stuff that is not important, and then, okay, this is what I want people to see at the end, and now let me think of the sequence of transitions that builds me up to that particular point, and that is going to be my scene. Okay, so let me see if I can, uh, you know, if I can kind of illustrate this with a small example from one of my talks from a long time ago. Okay, so in this particular case, what I wanted to do is it's, it's not super important what the example is, obviously, but I just want to show you this kind of trajectory, right? Um, so I wanted to explain to people a particular data structure called an interval set. And this will be I mean, quite easy to grasp for people at CAV, but here's what I roughly did. So that was my landmark. I want people to understand there's a data structure called an interval set. And here was the complete example. So notice that this is not by accident. I, these, these, these kind of handwritten sketches were not made for this particular talk. These handwritten sketches were just things I had, you know, several years before I made this talk, right? I first, you know, sketched out on a, you know, on a piece of paper, the complete example. I want a slide that's gonna look like this. I wanna have, what is the purpose of an interval set? It represents a set of integers by ordering them into a list and whatever, then splits that list up into compact intervals, right? That was a complete example. And then I worked backwards. I sort of split things up. So that's the whole thing that I'm going to delete the last one. And then I'm going to delete the last one. So I'll have this sequence of transitions. And then finally, it gets rendered something like this, right? Here's an interval set. Here's a data structure. Um, and then I order that sequence of numbers. And then I can partition those into intervals, right? So this was it. That, that's the whole sequence, right? And that's what I mean by a scene. And once you're done with a scene, one of the other heuristics I like to use is, does the scene make sense without audio? If you were, I mean, if you were, if, if you were actually listening to the talk live, of course, the speaker would not be mute. Uh, but, you know, online that might happen. It's, it's not an unrealistic thing for it to happen. Um, but nevertheless, the reason you want to ask yourself this heuristic is, does the scene make sense without audio? Is because if you find when you are giving your talk that you are explaining a lot of things about your scene, but there is no visual kind of, uh, there's no visual anchor to your words, then that's a sign that there should have been something on your slides in the first place, okay? Because that's, it's very easy for people to tune out for a second uh, to whatever your words were, because again, those are kind of ephemeral. You really want something up on your, on, on the screen uh, for something to, for, see, for people to be able to look at visually, uh, because otherwise they might miss your message. And you've once again lost focus. Okay, great. So that's a scene. It's a sequence of transitions that builds up to a particular landmark by an example. And ideally, it should make sense without any audio. Um, should I pause here, Arjun, for a question? Because I'm now going to transition into uh, the third part where I'm going to talk about frames. Yeah. Uh, uh, so there, there is a question about what um, software um, you use to prepare your slides. That's, I see, what, I mean, so I don't want to get too dragged into this, but this is an easy answer. So I personally use Keynote. Um, I mean, I, I have a Mac. I, I, there's no particular reason. I think, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't, I, I was going to say I don't have a particular opinion, but of course I have very strong opinions on this. I just don't know if I should uh, go into them. Um, I, I like Keynote for various reasons. But it sounds like an ad. I don't want to be like shilling for Apple at this point. Well, I'll tell you why I like it. I, I like it because it's just the defaults are it's easier to make um, it's easier to make nice looking slides. But you know, I mean, you can do the same thing with PowerPoint. Um, I had a I, I always I used to tell my students for God's sake don't use Open Office or uh, or or Google Slides or whatever. But sometimes they don't you know they just ignore my advice and then they make the slides and you know what it looks fine. So. I don't. I don't think you should worry too much about this this kind of thing. Um, but yeah. So I personally use Keynote, but but that you know. But it's not it's not the most important thing. Yeah. You should use whatever you're most comfortable with. Uh, but I will I will get back to this. Anon has asked this, so I don't know who, who it is. But mm. I will get back to one thing, which is there are certain built-in defaults that all kind of talk making software 
whatever slide making programs have. I never use those. Um, and, you know, I, I'll talk about it. And, and specifically, I, I refer to bullet points. I hate bullet points. I, I'm saying it now because there's a slide like in three minutes where I say the same thing. So, so I really don't like that. So I, I, like, I like things where I get to figure out exactly where to place things on slides, exactly how I like it. And anything, you know, these days, everything lets you do that. So you can use whatever. Um, let's see, for examples, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the slide. Is that okay, uh, Arjun? I'm just yeah, no, that, that is fine. Yeah. Makes my job easier. Okay. Uh, for examples like interval sets, do you prefer adding to the slide or adjusting the current text, animate it with hide then show? Interesting. Um, adding to the slide. That's a good question. So as I said, I, I actually really, the way I physically, like, the way I physically do it is by deleting from the slide. It's not by adding uh, because it's often, you know, when I said this thing about working backwards, it's A for, you know, when you're designing, but also B when you're implementing, it's often a lot easier to start with the last slide first because the last slide usually has the most detail because it has like everything on it or whatever, right? And you really want to adjust that to make sure that it's not ugly and everything makes sense and it's not too busy and this, that, and the other. And once you have that, it's actually easier to start removing things. So I often actually prefer to move things. But actually, oddly enough, this comes back to the previous question of uh, Keynote versus PowerPoint. There is this very nice feature that Keynote has, which maybe PowerPoint also has now called Magic Move where, so you notice this particular talk has a whole bunch of animations. You don't have to specify any of those animations. It just, Keynote has this nice thing where it just looks at, oh, frame is over here in this position on this slide and in the next slide it's in that position. It just does the transition on its own. So it's very robust that way. So I also like it for that reason. Oh boy, <laughs> follow up versus uh, thoughts on LaTeX Beamer. Let's hold this to the end. I don't want to turn this into a VI versus Emacs type of uh, sort of situation. I do have thoughts. I don't like Beamer very much, but uh, but I can, but I appreciate that um, you know if you have a very technical kind of thing where you need a bunch of math, then you really want to use Beamer. And I've seen people. I've seen people again give really amazing talks, and then I saw, wow, that was made with Beamer. You sir or lady are a wizard. Um, so I've seen it happen. But there's a danger with a lot of Beamer talks. They all kind of look the same. And it's just, oh, it's, it's very easy to kind of lose focus. Okay, let me move on. And let me look at the time also, by the way. Oh, 12.38. Okay, very good. Um, so let's next talk about frames. So I told you about the overall arc, which is the, the story. It's a sequence of landmarks. Um, then I told you about scenes, which are individual segments of this path from one landmark to the next landmark. And finally, you know, at the end of the day, you have to, of course, construct your talk, which is going to have individual slides. And that is what is a single frame. And so this brings us to the question of what ultimately goes on a single slide. And maybe this will also get to the question somebody asked about, do you add things or do you remove things and so on and so forth, right? So a frame is what is on one single slide at a particular point in time. Now, getting back to my, you know, the recurring thing, enabling focus, this is the one kind of invariant that I just, I cannot emphasize enough, okay? At any one point in time, in any one individual frame, there should be exactly one thing for the audience member to be looking at. It should be completely obvious what that one thing is. It's fine for there to be multiple actual things on the slide, but there should be one thing that they should be focusing on. And that is what I use to guide my design of individual frames. And remember, of course, a frame, a sequence of frames makes up a, a, a scene, right? So how do I make this focus completely obvious? I don't want you to have to think. I don't want you to have, there's four things on a slide right now. Am I supposed to be looking at the top right corner, the top left corner, the bottom right or the bottom left? Because again, too much thinking equals, ah, oh, this is too much candy crush, okay? So I want it to be completely obvious. So one way to be completely obvious is to do what I just did on this one slide, right? If there's two words, well, guess what you're looking at? You're probably looking at, well, you might be looking at me gesticulating, but that's fine. You're probably looking at the two words, be minimal. So if you can get away with just like, or uh, Jonathan Shuchuk has a nice write-up on how to design slides as well. Um, if you can just make the focus completely obvious because there's one thing to look at, then you should just do that, okay? So this is what Shuchuk calls his 12 words per slide rule. Now, I should point out, this is a kind of uh, somewhat draconian thing, and in many situations, it's not possible. But nevertheless, it's something you should strive towards if possible. 
However, never ever make slides like this. Okay, this is like the exact opposite of what I just told you. Okay, the be minimal slide. So I mean, there's just lots of things that are wrong about it. The biggest thing that's wrong about it is I don't know what I should be looking at. Again, I I have this I have this very kind of adversarial view of of the audience in a sense where I'm imagining somebody is just imagine they just zoned out for the last five minutes and they just open their eyes and they're looking at a slide like this. What is they supposed to be looking at? Should they be looking at the title? Should they be looking at the bullets? The first bullet, the third bullet, the seventh bullet? Who knows what's going on, right? Um, I really dislike nested bullets. I dislike bullets. I dislike nested bullets and triply nested bullets. I really don't like because it's just that there's something visual about them that I, I dislike. Um, but the thing that, and this is a really pedantic thing, and I, I, I don't know if it's just me. I don't think it's just me. Um, but I, But nevertheless, if you can avoid it, do so, I beseech you, is do not wrap text around, okay? So if you have like long text and somehow your eyes have to go back, do this kind of visual carriage return, there is something very taxing about it. So if you can, please just have it so you read text left to right and that's it, it ends, okay? You don't really need full sentences. You can drop words, it's fine. Just make it one row and your audience members will thank you for it. Okay, that's it. That I don't like that slide. Let's go back. Oops, my daughter is hounding at me. Okay, so sometimes you cannot be minimal. You can't. You need more than twelve words. Okay, in that case, what you can do is to be incremental. So this I've already said. You start with the final example and you gradually build up to the landmark, right? Um, so this way, the audience member knows that what they should be focusing on at any one point in time is the diff right, is the delta between this and the previous slides. So if I show you, this was the first snapshot, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, then I know, oh, what I should be looking at is the diff, okay? So, for example, if we return to this uh, interval sets example, um, I'm just sort of replaying the old video, right? So this is my data structure to represent sets, and now as the video plays, you can see, oh, your eyes sort of visually just go to the place where the change happens, and that's where you're supposed to be paying attention. So, either be super minimal, 12 words or less, it's obvious, or be incremental. But sometimes, you know, you just need a whole bunch of stuff on the slides and, you know, it's not enough just to be incremental. In that case, what you want to do is you want to make the focus completely obvious. Just highlight the focus. To make an analogy, um, I guess all my analogies now have to do with like little children because, you know, I have little children. But in this particular analogy it has to do with, uh, you know, some of you may have seen these books. It's a kind of, it's like a game that you play called Where's Waldo? So this, this young man over here is Waldo. This is what he looks like. He has this kind of red striped shirt and these big glasses, right? And the game in each of these books, these are like, you know, little books, is they have these very busy looking pictures with like lots of people and your job is to find Waldo, right? So for example, here is a picture, here is Waldo. Somewhere in this picture is Waldo. And... Sometimes you just need slides with like a bunch of detail. You don't have like a code snippet or a bunch of math or some definition, something. Where is Waldo? Well, here's how you highlight the focus. There is Waldo. Okay, so you can just fade everything else out and tell me where I should be looking. So of course, now usually when you are giving talks, it's not going to be playing where's Waldo. You are actually giving something technical. So here's how you might do it. Uh, again, using this running example of interval sets, right? So. I had this thing, this partitioning into intervals. It's, it's not super important. Next, what I wanted to show is here's a data type that represents this, this data structure, right? And as you'll see, there's a bunch of stuff going on on the side. So there's data type, la, la, la. And here's how I was highlighting the focus. So the interval sets, I sort of show you in blue, this is what you're supposed to be looking at. It's fine to not pay attention to anything else. Okay, so to pop up again, in order to design an individual frame, where a frame is what I should be looking at at one point in time, there should be exactly one thing that, it, that the audience member should be focusing on. And you want to make that completely obvious, either by just putting one thing up on the slide or sort of building it up in this transition wise and making the diffs very obvious. Or if there's just a whole bunch of things, tell me, show, show me some obvious zoom uh, or highlight that tells me what I should be paying attention to at any point in time, right? Okay, good. So that's pretty much all I'm going to say about, you know, how I think about design talks. You want to start in this, it's this very top-down approach. You start with your goal, you identify your landmarks towards the goal. Then having identified the landmarks, you sort of think of your individual scenes by building up the individual examples. And then at that point, you start thinking of the individual frames. And if it's not clear, I really only start, I open up my 
keynote or PowerPoint or Beamer or what have you, only at step three. Once I have a pretty good idea of steps one and two, you know, in steps one and two, I strongly encourage you to just do this just pencil and paper or even just like a text document because the story and scene should be, you know, are things that you can work on without the distractions of how you want to actually render the frames. Now, things are, of course, complicated by the fact that, you know, when it comes down to the frame, you'll see, oh, wait, there was this circular dependency. I forgot I had to explain so and so. You have to go back to the story or you'll find that I should have explained this one thing much earlier because that'll make it easier to, you know, it'll simplify something that's on a frame. And so there is some amount of iteration and, you know, you just have to do it a couple of times until you get to a fixed point. And then, uh, you know, you can, you, you'll actually have a nice talk, right? So that's all I'm going to say about design. I, I want to end with just a few words about how to deliver talks. Um, Rupak had a very nice uh, talk yesterday on how to create content, which was just how to go about thinking of the research process in the first place. But let me just say a few things about how to deliver talks. So there's no, there's no like magic bullet. There's a, there's a couple of things I will say. For those of you who are doing PhDs uh, or are in graduate school, one excellent preparation is TAing because you, you sort of are in front of your class. Well, I should say in, in sort of normal times, you are in front of a class, even now in, on Zoom or whatever, in front of a class explaining things. And that just, you know, builds up a certain amount of uh, experience and expertise and comfort with the whole butterflies in the stomach thing. But then there's also some of it is just plain preparation, right? So uh, I strongly recommend that you go and look for, if you haven't, if you don't know about this gentleman, uh, James Mickens is now a professor at uh, Harvard, if I, yes, at Harvard. And he gives really, I mean, he's just an amazing speaker. He's a very kind of entertaining speaker. It's, it's really something, right? And um, this lady asked, uh, you know, asked him once, she's like, what is the, you have some magic bullet or what? And it's like, yeah, my magic bullet, I, I just look at a lot of other fantastic speakers and I spend months preparing each of those talks. So some of it is just that, right? You just have to practice um, until you get good at it. But uh, TAing has this nice benefit of, you know, it gives you a kind of a concrete way to practice. The second thing I will say is just, look at other really good speakers and they don't have to be computer scientists. Of course, there are very good computer scientists who, you know, give excellent talks, but there are also people, you know, in the broader world. And perhaps the best of these are preachers like, uh, you know, the pastor who, uh, who wrote the little thing on three parts of a sermon, right? Um, so just like go and, you know, on YouTube, you can find videos of, uh, of just fantastic preachers or fantastic politicians. Of course, not all politicians are created equal. Some give, you know, are far better speakers than others. Or the third thing that might not occur to you is comedians. They really, you know, these are people who talk professionally for a living. They really know how you have to kind of set up the pacing and how you pause and how you reveal things at various places. You don't reveal things. There's a lot to be learned just by seeing fantastic speakers speak. Um, so, and you know what? Sometimes it's a good excuse to get on Netflix. Um, so th these are all uh, re reasonable ex excuses that you can give to your advisor when you're streaming the next comedy special. Okay, so that's pretty much it. I'm going to kind of end on this. Uh, the way I think of designing talks, I'm going to sort of end with my outline, which was also my general roadmap. Start with your goal, right? Uh, think of what your overall arc is. What are the landmarks that are going to build up towards your goal? Once you have the landmarks, you can now do this modular design, right? Where you can think of, okay, what's my individual scenes? What are my individual scenes going to be? Where each scene is the path to the next landmark. And finally, once you have your scenes, you can start thinking about rendering each individual frame where the lesson you want to bear in mind is to make the focus absolutely obvious. Okay, um, that's all I'm going to say. Here are a few more uh, pieces of advice that you can look at. I'll just flash this up and it'll be on the slides. Uh, Derek uh, Dreyer has a nice talk, which is more specific to giving talks at conferences. And it addresses very much this uh, issue that I think Saptarshi asked about what is the relationship between your paper and what's in your actual slides and how, you know, what, what, what is the commonalities and differences. And Jonathan Shuchuk has this nice uh, web page where he has a lot of... Uh, um, uh, interesting advice as well. But let me just um, stop there and take some more questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we we have some really great questions here. Uh, one of them is, how do you preempt or avoid certain questions to maintain flow? Like how questions you... about hmm. yeah, questions about later material or irrelevant so, questions. That's, that's a good... How do you preempt or avoid... Um, that's a good, well, so I guess, hmm, let me think about this. 
So there are, I mean, the way I think about this is there are often, there are two extremes. So one extreme is where you have a talk where people are supposed to hold questions towards the end, right? Um, and there are other kinds of talks which are more interactive and you want questions like as you go. Okay, and the way you would think about these two talks is naturally quite different. So sometimes you want to make the talk in a way that you are constantly, you know, provoking questions and you want people to be raising their hands and asking questions. And, uh, but this is more like when you're lecturing, if you're giving a lecture, like in an in-class lecture, I rig it so that I'm just like, I'm throwing questions out that I pretend I don't know the answer to, or I, you know how I said definition before use? In lecture, I often invert that. I put out the use and then I deliberately, I deliberately put that because I want you to think about, wait, why did he do this? What does this even mean? I don't understand. Um, because then we are going to be kind of talking about that particular thing and so on, right? Versus the kind of talk where, which this was really more about where I want to anticipate as many questions as possible. And I want to put all the definitions first. So I want to avoid confusing you. So I guess the two kinds of talks are one where I want to, where I want to make confusion part of the part of the process. Um, and that works well when it's a much smaller thing and it's a much more interactive thing versus when you're giving a talk at a conference where I do not want to make confusion part of the process because their confusion means I've lost you. Right, so you want to distinguish between those two, and in this particular talk was very much tailored towards. I don't want to confuse you. I want to kind of anticipate as many questions as possible. I want to put the definitions before the use. I want to make sure that you're engaged all the time. Um, does that make sense? But there are there are talks where that's not the case. I really want to kind of. Um, I really want to make it more interactive, which means I want to confuse you a bit. Does that answer the, the, I guess this was Nishan's question. How do I, irrelevant questions often prompted by images. Yeah, again, sometimes, yeah, you don't want to, yeah, there is a fine line there, right? Between distracting people and between entertaining you and distracting you, I guess. And there is, you know, there's, there's a fine line there that you want to kind of balance that, that you have to kind of keep an eye on. Let's see, Hamad asks, sorry, Arjun, were you going to ask the question? Uh, no, I, I was asking, uh, going to ask Noreen's question ah, okay. about uh, what do, what you, do you do if you gave a talk in the past and it did not go well, you know, you could have done better while preparing or delivering the talk, but it's over. That's a good, that's an excellent question. Well, I would say the, hmm, that's a very good question. Let me think about it. The first thing I would ask myself is the first thing I would try to understand that's a really good question. Let me click the thumbs up button myself. I would try to understand what aspect of it did not go well. I mean, I would. I, it's like a debugging process almost, right? Why? So first of all, why do you think it? So I should say, why do you think it did not go well? Often you think a talk didn't go well, but in fact, it went very well, right? So you should first make sure that in fact, it did not go well. Second, I would try to understand which parts of the talk did not go well. Was the, Were there some specific aspects that... Um, so, for example, Noreen, one of the, it's, it sounds from the question that you are worried, you know you could have done better while preparing or delivering the talk, but it's over. A, you don't know that it, it, it's over. Of course, that particular talk is a done deal now. You'll never get, I mean, that time is passed. But you may have to give the same talk again. But if not, you want to kind of learn from the experience, right, for the next talk. So I would try to figure out which part of the talk did not go well. So, for example, it might be that there was some segment of the talk that was too confusing. Um, that, you know, there was, so there are some common, there are some common kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, failure modes, right? Where something I didn't talk about over here is when I said, oh, you assume the audience is at problem and you want to show them to the solution. Well, sometimes it's a very mixed audience and some people know what the problem is and other people don't know what the problem is. And one of the common failure modes is that you tailor your starting point or your landmarks to one set of people say people who are experts in the area. And uh, and as a consequence, you've already lost a wide swathe of your audience, right? Or you could make the mistake in the other direction where you assume that people know nothing and you have all this kind of set up expository on the background. And so you've bored a bunch of people because yes, 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 we know all this stuff. And you know, they would. So at any rate, what you would first want to do is try to understand what worked or did not work. And I should point out once again, you know, I mentioned this thing about TAing. TAing is very good for this because it helps you build up an intuition on, you know, on whether people are getting it or not. So to answer Noreen's question, I think the first thing I would try to understand is what worked and did not work and then try to iterate on that. 
Was it the choice of landmarks? Was it that some once some slides were too detailed? Was it that I was speaking too much? I had too much content and so on and so forth. And what you'll find is that learning learning what this is, even if you can't fix your previous talk, it will kind of help you fix the next one, right? It'll help you, it'll sort of guide the design of the next one in a way that will avoid that particular problem. Basically, you get better. The more, the more of it you do, as with so many other things, the better you get. Arjun, can I ask for the next question? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so I guess Hamad's question is the most important one. What are your thoughts on using your talk to advertise yourself? Oh, look, I mean, as I said, you know, up at the up at, up at the beginning, your entire talk is an advertisement for yourself, right? So by all means, if you are in fact up on the job market, then certainly by all means, you should put it up. There's no question of it. Um, so yes, double thumbs up, must do it. Please hire me next year, et cetera, et cetera. The real point is, uh, as uh, one of my uh, one of my friends, uh, Jens Palsberg, who's a professor at UCLA, pointed out to me. Actually, he pointed out in somebody else's thesis defense. He, was, uh, he said, "Every talk is a job talk. Doesn't matter who you're. Like, you should just think of every talk that you're giving as is an advertisement for you. And this is, you know, partly why I, you know, why you should really. And this is again not just if you're going from undergrad to grad or grad school to whatever, right?" Um, Right now, I mean, some of you probably know this. There are lots of lots of these kinds of uh, tech conferences where there are lots of people who give talks on. It's not necessarily new work, right? They are giving work describing some some technique or some tool or some technology and so on and so forth. And a lot of this is, of course, trying to explain these new ideas that they find interesting to other people. But a lot of it is also kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, building up their brand. And yeah, that's what it's there for. So you should you should embrace it, uh, and you should totally. Um, uh, but by all means, advertise. But because it's an advertisement, make sure you really uh, you really kind of give it your best shot as it were. Yes. Next question, Arjun. Yeah. So I guess the yeah. What should I do to prepare for situations where I blank out? And I think that's probably more of a concern when you're starting out rather than later no it's totally a concern right now are you kidding me <laughs> i'm i'm constantly worried about it so but i have a it's a weird thing i can't i can't interact but i'll just have to anticipate your uh, i'll anticipate your question so there are two kinds of blanking out right one is when you blank out in the middle of your talk while you are delivering your talk versus uh, versus the situation when you blank out when somebody asks you a question Right. So let's just let's split the let's split your question into these two parts. So part one, how do you what how do you deal with the part where uh, where I blank out? So that one is simple. You practice, practice, practice until you can give the talk in your sleep. So um, I will actually give you another piece of advice that I got from Ken uh, back when I was preparing my first cab talk. And I, I and it was a paper I wrote with Ken, you know, 20 years ago. And I told Ken, Ken, this talk is taking too long. It takes like 35 minutes. And of course, the talk slot was like 20 minutes. And Ken said, and I remember this expression because it's a, it's a very nice expression. Like, look, that's don't worry that it takes 35 minutes now. Um, you just keep practicing it. And you'll find as you practice the talk, A, it'll come more, it'll become more gelled in your head. And B, you'll find that there's just a lot of, and I believe this, this was his exact expression, there's a lot of air that gets squeezed out in your talk. You know, there's lots of, um, uh, or, um, there's all this kind of stuff where you'll just find it's like muscle memory. You know, I, uh, I recently started learning how to play the piano using this app called Simply Piano. And it's amazing. I mean, it's great, but I, I cannot believe how good it is. But a lot of it is just like, it's in your muscles now. And I can't, I can't tell you what I'm doing. It's just in my muscles. And a lot of that, is just, you know, in, when you're giving these talks, you won't blank out just because you practice the talk so many times. I want to say another thing about practice, though, which is often people think when you practice, you must practice the whole 20 minutes or the whole one hour all at once. No. Once you've broken it up into the sequence of scenes, you can just practice each individual scene. And this goes back even to Noreen's question. You might find that there are individual scenes that work and don't work. And you can then replace those scenes with other scenes. So both with practice as well as with editing, this kind of breaking it down into these rigid scenes where you have these intermediate landmarks as boundaries, um, as summaries, if you will, of the previous part of the talk, it's valuable for many reasons. You can kind of drill down and you know uh, practice each individual scene. Now the second part of blanking out has to do when people ask you a question and you're like, and you sort of, 
you know, you freeze. You're like, I don't know um, what to do, right? So first of all, again, if you TA, you'll find you get better at this. You just learn there are a bunch of delay tactics. So classic delay tactic is something that I just did right now is let me see if I understand your question, right? There are two possible hypotheses over here. One, you are asking me about, uh, do you mean blanking out during the talk or do you mean blanking out during the question? So part of that, I did it because I was, in fact, trying to understand your question. But part of that, I was just doing it as a kind of, you know, uh, to, in, to, to introduce a few bubbles in my, in my uh, what do you call it, in my pipeline architecture, right? I just want some pause. I want a little gap so that I can think about how best to answer your question. So that's one, one thing you can do. Um, it's fine to just pause, you know, you just try and take pause for a minute and kind of gather your thoughts. The third thing I will say is it's if it's in a live if it's in a live setting where you can actually ask the ask the person who asked the question what they meant that's valuable because then uh, you know it buys you some time but more than that what it buys you is it lets you understand what really their question was so what I mean by that is I was telling somebody else this yesterday often when you're uh, especially this happens when you're starting out when you're giving a talk at CAV and you know like some you know some sort of graybeard or whatever asks you a question you get very intimidated and you think oh no this person has asked some you know they have found the deepest darkest secret about my work and the whole thing is a house of cards and it's now come crumbling because i didn't think of this 99 times out of 100 that's not the case at all the answer to their question is just something like oh that is explained on table four in my paper you know, they're asking for something very, so what happens is because, you know, natural language is the ambiguous uh, kind of medium that it is, they are asking a question, but that question can have many different interpretations. And especially as a young person starting out, you often find the most adversarial interpretation. You think they have found the deepest, darkest secret, whereas in fact, they have found some, they are asking something quite innocuous. So I would say the number one thing to do if you blank out is just to, you know, start up a dialogue. Like, explain to me a little bit, just what, what exactly are you asking? And then this person will clarify and so on and so forth, right? But again, the answer, the real answer to all of this is practice. Um, practice, you know, if you can TA, take every opportunity you can to get up and do public speaking because most of this kind of butterflies in your stomach, uh, butterflies in your stomach is because, um, it's just that you are unused to it. It's a kind of, it's not a, it's not a natural act to be speaking to whatever a hundred people or 50 people all at once, right? So the more of it that you do, the easier it'll get and the more comfortable you'll get with, um, you know, with not blanking out. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think we are uh, out of time now and Rupsha wants to uh, say some concluding remarks. Okay, So fantastic. I guess um, if you're around on Disco, um, I yeah, totally. I'll be around. Okay, then I guess we can take the rest of the questions on this group. Fantastic. Uh, Thank thanks you. a lot for the talk. It was thanks, really Arjun. useful. And um, yeah, let me um, uh, yeah, let me hand over to Rupsa. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thank you uh, to everyone who's watching this and who has uh, been around on the Slack channel, on Disco, on YouTube, on Twitter uh, for joining us. Uh, thanks a lot for your support. Um, you were an amazing engaged audience and, and uh, it feels wonderful uh, to have been able to bring this to you. Um, I also want to thank uh, a few more people uh, specifically so I would first uh, like to thank my incredible, incredible uh, committee with um, Raina Dimitrova. I don't know if you can just uh, join me here in this uh, meeting and maybe turn your videos on. Um, Raina Dimitrova, then jean Baptiste Jienin and uh, Arjun Radhakrishna. Uh, you, each of you brought a lot of your uh, energy, creativity, um, and time uh, uh, and ideas to the table. And um, I've, we really couldn't have pulled off uh, the program that we did without uh, each of you, um, especially the, the two new things we tried out this year, which was the survey and, uh, uh, and bringing in a speaker uh, for uh, an important uh, uh, talk on anti-racism. So uh, you are, I know you're all really busy people. So thank, a huge thanks for, for your uh, time and support. 
I would also like to thank uh, uh, some of our student uh, volunteers, uh, Mohit Tekriwal, uh, Noor Aldin Jaber, and Hamad uh, Ahmad, who uh, have been around uh, creating uh, a buzz on the Slack channel, uh, answering questions, uh, keeping up the momentum, and also helping us with some technical issues on, uh, on Zoom or, or YouTube. So thanks a lot again uh, for, for your help. Uh, I also want to obviously thank uh, our amazing set of speakers and panelists. This again program would would not have been possible without uh, uh, without all of you. Uh, Rajiv, Rupak, Eva, Nikki, Swarat, uh, Martha, uh, Justin, uh, Liana, Ken, and Ranjit. Uh, huge thanks uh, for your uh, past and continuing support of mentoring workshops and and this particular one in general. Uh, you all gave memorable talks that are almost all of which are going to be now uh, available on YouTube for a viewing later, even for people who couldn't make it uh, to our workshop. I uh, would like to uh, thank Aarti and um, uh, Aarti Gupta and Nina Amla and other members of the CAF steering committee who uh, have um, continually supported uh, VMW and uh, also uh, this particular version of uh, VMW. In the broader mentoring uh, uh, community, I have had several people help me out, uh, help me figure out how to organize a, a workshop like this. Uh, um, uh, so I thank uh, Loris D'Antoni, who was the chair last year for uh, some advice. And I thank uh, Alexandra, uh, Silva and Milind Kulkarni for uh, helping me uh, finalize some of the things for, for this workshop and also letting me know what to look out for for a virtual uh, VMW. So that's it. Uh, let's all uh, move on to disco uh, for our final uh, hallway track. And uh, thanks again uh, for being here. Yeah, and uh, thanks to Rupsa for heading the organizing committee. Uh, she really took care of everything. There was uh, very little for the rest of us to do. She took care of most of the planning. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we are. Uh, Let's move ready to on to disco then.